Now, uh, the power of plurality in counter, we make sure it's the same as the poster, emergence and boundary making in the 19th century industrial far west. And as you know, he's a uh, graduate student here in the anthropology program, and I'm assuming this is. Yeah, this is it. <laughs> yeah, and this is his exit talk. So, really. All right. Thank you, Brian. Proceed. And thank you to everyone who's here. I know we just got the SAAs. Everyone's probably sick of hearing talks, so I know it probably took all of your being to, to be here. So I appreciate it. Um, as Christina said, I'm going to be talking today on my dissertation work at the Samuel Adams Lyman Council, which are located just outside of uh, Santa Cruz, California. And I want to start my talk in the year 1904, which is actually towards the end of the Samuel Adams story, as the operation closed in 1909. 1904, though, was the year that quickline production in volume peaked in Santa Cruz County. So in an economic sense, we could say that this was the height of the Santa Cruz Lyman industry. But 1904 was also the years that the industry was rattled by the mobilization of working class labor, as a series of union organized strikes were brought against the two major lime companies um, that dominated the local industry. The Henry Cowell Lyman's Men Company, the owner of the Samuel Adams operation at that time, being one of those two companies. And while labor organization had been gaining momentum, in California throughout the late 19th century and early 20th century, these moments of collective action in the lime industry marked a significant shift in relations of power in an industry that was long known for its diverse, transient immigrant workforce and domineering industrial capitalist owners. These Samuel Adams kilns were one of a number of lime operations that dotted the western foothills of the Santa Cruz Mountains, beginning around the 1850s. These kiln sites operated as company towns and were pluralistic sites places of encounter where diverse people emigrating from across the globe lived and worked together in intimate and sustained ways, spending months together in close proximity, rotating through long shifts in workspaces, sharing meals in the company mess hall, and in many cases living together in small one-room cabins. In these intimate encounters of daily life, workers would have been forced to negotiate alterity, to work through differences, and to work together to make a life in the industrial frontier. In doing so, workers would have built novel connections, uh, relations, and communities that cut across and reconfigured traditional boundaries of social difference. Despite this, de uh, this demographic diversity and variability over time, we know, as I've suggested, that the workforce of immigrant laborers came together in 1904 in a series of union organized strikes. And in those, they demanded better wages, better housing practices, and a closed shop hiring system, which is basically where the companies only hire union members. We also know that these unions were not organized along ethnic lines. Uh, as historic documents show that the line workers, coopers, and teamsters unions um, were ethnically diverse in membership. The situation then presents us with a challenging question. How did it come to a point where a highly diverse workforce of immigrant diverse could come together across these various meaningful axes of difference, things like ethnicity, language, occupation, and or class, and unite as a collective, organized, and mobilized labor community? I'm not the first person to ask this type of question. A number of historical archaeologists have explored how diverse uh, groups work together in the industrial West. These scholars have investigated what they variously call interethnic coalitions. They have explored how similarities in the life and labor cross cut cultural differences within the community, creating the basis of a shared class consciousness. And they've described the multi ethnic nature of class in the 19th and 20th century. And while these studies are foundational in highlighting historical examples of worker unity across diversity and the ways in which archaeological analysis can provide insights into these events, they all work from what I think are rigid and static understandings of ethnicity and class as distinct and separate identity categories linked through labor. In this way, workers are seen as overcoming their ethnic differences, willing to silo these aspects of their identity in the construction of a unifying class consciousness. What I'm proposing is slightly different take on that. Rather than seeing labor communities form along shared class experiences despite ethnic differences, I'm arguing that workers form novel, novel labor communities precisely because of their cultural differences. It was diversity itself and the very process of negotiating these various differences in everyday encounters that resulted in new ways of doing and being. 
a blending, reconfiguring, reentangling, and hybridizing of social material practices that were, that were co-constituted and shared, emerging from difference. In their communal production and shared enactment, these emerging practices work to create and forge novel connections between workers that reshape community boundaries and relations. This would suggest then that unionization did not produce labor groups, as is often suggested. Rather, unionization was itself a product of formation and development of novel labor communities through the emergence of shared practices. So this approach to investigating pluralism and community formation is framed by new materialist theories. The ideas and vocabulary I've found particularly effective for moving beyond the dialectical limitations of post-colonial theories, uh, and especially productive for thinking about how, materi how materials are entangled in meaning and boundary making. New materialism works from a central notion that materials are active and agentive, and that matter and meaning are not separate elements, but are inextricably fused together. In this way, all material bodies, human or non-human, emerge through interactions that reconfigure the material world. The concept of intra-action, which is foundational to my approach, comes from the work of Karen Barad. Um, whereas interaction assumes two fixed, predefined, and independent bodies coming into a relationship, for example, the ways in which we've often talked about colonizer and colonized, interaction is concerned with the mutual constitution of entangled agencies, where entities materialize in co-constitutive ways, emerging through the relationship of interacting. In this way, material bodies, again, both human and non-human, are seen as emergent phenomena, material assemblages that are products of ongoing interactivity, continuously taking shape through the dynamics of differentiation. So emergence in this light recognizes that any phenomenon, be it a ceramic plate, an edge-modified shard of glass, or even a community identity, are in a constant state of becoming through material discursive interactions. Emergence recognizes that history matters in the shaping of possibilities, but each interaction is co-constituted, and thus there is always the potential for creativity, for newness, for a novel emergence of something that is neither one nor the other, uh, some greater than its part, if you will. Differentiation, then, is not about othering or separating, but about boundary-making through reconfiguration, connection, and entanglement. Differentiation is about diffraction. In Barad's words, quote, diffraction is not merely about differences, and certainly not differences in any absolute sense, but about the entangled nature of differences that matter. Diffraction is a material practice for making a difference, for topologically reconfiguring connections. New materialism, then, gives us the perspectives and vocabulary to attempt to talk about alterity through an examination of materials without slipping into dualisms, like self, other, human, object, or nature and culture, and instead think about the ways in which particular phenomena, bodies, material objects, assemblages, and sites, but also social groups, identities, and subjectivities, emerge through diffraction. Also relevant for this discussion is Anna Singh's notion of contaminated diversity. In this idea, she's recognizing that collaboration is a fundamental aspect of life. But collaboration means working across differences, which leads to contamination. Sim conceptualizes emergence as transformation through encounter. Recognizing that instability of social categories and boundaries, she argues that we must watch how things, categories, groups, and connections and collaborations emerge through encounter. Singh argues that, quote, we must look for histories that develop through contamination to explore how a gathering became a happening. Ideas that I found particularly effective for exploring the pluralistic social relations um, that I'm going to be getting to. So a little context for why these ideas are useful for thinking about 19th century industrial sites and uh, Samuel Abbey site in particular. The Santa Cruz uh, lime industry was a historical outgrowth of the California gold rush. And was one part of the rapid social, demographic, economic, technological, and environmental change associated with that event in the subsequent period. California went from, in 1848, being a remote fringe western outpost of, of colonial Spain with a population of around 160,000, all except for about 1,000 being indigenous California peoples, to, by 1850, um, being a central node in the global economy with a population of more than twice its 1848 number, almost all of that increase being non-native people. As a result of this particular historical development, many places, communities, and industries in post gold rush California were extremely diverse from their origin. In these pluralistic spaces, day-to-day -day encounters and interactions were between many heterogeneous groups or communities, 
people came to these places already contaminated through histories of encounter. The St. Adams Landfill operation was one of these post cold rust pluralistic spaces. Established in 1858 by 27-year-old Samuel Adams, an entrepreneur and businessman from New York, it started as an independent two-pot kiln complex that employed about 30 men. While the, while the workforce was originally comprised entirely of laborers from the East Coast of the United States and Canada, over the next 50 years, until its closure in 1909, the St. Adams workforce and the wider Santa Cruz lime industry, like the broader state of California, would change considerably as subsequent waves of immigrants came to the Central Coast and found employment in wage labor positions at the kiln operation. Of note in the history of this kiln site is the change of ownership that occurred in 1869. Facing a depression in the lime industry, Samuel Adams sold his independent operation to the Davis and Cowell Company, which would later become the Henry Cowell Lime and Cement Company. Henry Cowell was your prototypical 19th century industrial capitalist, and he ruthlessly acquired capital, labor, and power throughout the wider Santa Cruz area in the mid to late 19th century. He used cyclical depressions in, line, in the lime industry to buy up independent operations, building a business conglomerate that by about the turn of the 20th century was very near to having a monopoly on the local industry. Um, how, that, how that affected workers' day to day lives is another aspect of my dissertation, but I'm only going to kind of touch on that today. The transition of ownership to Cowell was associated with substantial changes to the Adams operation. Our archaeological work there allowed us to determine that shortly after Cowell took ownership, the operation expanded to the already existing two-pot operation that, work? Yes, it did. Um, that also included a foreman's residence and a shared workers' cabin. The Cowell expansion around 1870 also included the construction of an additional kiln pot, making it a three-pot operation, as well as the construction of an additional workers' cabin to house the presumably larger workforce associated with the additional kiln, and the addition of a foreman's office, cold storage room, and expansions or additions to the cookhouse and the mess hall. So the change in ownership and operation expansion also coincided with shifts in the demography of the workforce. It's kind of hard to read. Uh, we can track these changes through census and other historic documents to see that over time, Cal pulled considerably from successive waves of immigrants. By the turn of the 20th century, this employment strategy, strategy resulted in a workforce at the Samuel Adams operation that was comprised of Irish immigrants who worked in managerial positions as operation foremen, and they oversaw a workforce of manual laborers, the couriers, the line burners, and the teamsters, who were comprised of some Irish workers, but predominantly made up of Portuguese immigrants, mostly from the Azorn Islands, and Italian immigrants from the Swiss-Italian border. From at least 1870 until the operation closure in 1909, there was also always a single Chinese immigrant employed as the company cook for the Sand Labs operation, although that specific individual changes over time. So before I get into the material examples and evidence that I'm going to talk about, um, and since the backdrop of this conversation is labor like exploitation, I feel, like <laughs> I feel like it's appropriate to give credit and thanks to the really awesome team of undergraduate students that worked in both the field and the lab with me on this project. So my dissertation field work was organized as a field school. At our largest, we had 13 students in the field and six in the lab. Um, four different institutions were represented, Berkeley, UC Santa Cruz, St. Mary's College, and West Valley College. Um, special thanks go out to Nick Perez and Chandler Fitzsimons, which I'm sure many of you know, they were graduates from here. They were just field staff, and really served as my eyes and ears when we had multiple units open. Um, big thanks go out to Sharon Hogan, who I think is here, who worked every semester in the lab that we had work going on. And she really took ownership over the flotation aspect of the work, um, among many other things. It was a huge help. Also, Aditi Ragna, who is, I hope is here as well, um, also in the lab for multiple semesters, uh, did many things, but was really, really helpful on helping me with the funnel analysis as well. Um, Priyanka Amit Patel wrote an undergraduate thesis that looked at the lime industry, that looked at unionization in the lime industry. Rebecca Geiger also did an undergraduate thesis. Uh, she also volunteered her truck as a second field vehicle, and um, after a week of my cooking, she quickly took over the field camp cooking logistics, and uh, you know, the not so little things that really make or break the field project. So, uh, but every undergrad was extremely helpful. I was um, really lucky to have such a great team and extremely indebted to them. That this really wouldn't have been possible without their without their help. And it's been great to see a number, of, actually a majority of them, have gone on to work. Uh, or have gone on to either grad programs in archaeology or professional programs.
you, so it's be great to see. So just a little background on our field work to give you a bit of necessary context for the discussion. Our field efforts were built on previous archaeological work that had been conducted in the early 2000s. We were lucky enough to get data, information, and the collections themselves from, from that work, so it served as a great sort of pilot study that clarified things like feature boundaries and uh, stratigraphic relationships. Um, and the previous work really allowed us to identify uh, likely data-rich intact deposits. It gave us a glimpse and hints as to the types of materials we might find in different areas, what the function of these different spaces might have been, um, and it highlighted unexplored areas that we might want to investigate. Uh, and this really allowed us to isolate areas that were going to be productive for our particular research questions and goals. Um, and it allowed us to employ a, a minimal amount of excavation units to recover our required data set. Um, allowing us to keep invasive disturbance to a minimum. And yes, we did find a whole kiln door. That was fun. Excavations were undertaken at various locations. Oh, excuse me. Let's skip this up. Um, oh, no. Excavations were undertaken at various locations across the Samuel Adams Lime Kiln site, which is on today, what is, or what is on what is today Wilder Ranch State Park, which is located just west of the city of Santa Cruz. Um, excavations were undertaken on what was determined to be <laughs> residential uh, or domestic spaces, including both of the shared workers' cabinets, um, also the foreman's private residence, also at the workspaces that included the foreman's office, the lime kilns themselves, those red belts were the actual units, the cooperage, the cookhouse, and the cold storage room, and the central communal gathering space. Uh, which would have been the company mess hall. Um, and here that is on the actual terrain, just giving you an idea of what it looked like out there. We excavated by natural stratigraphy whenever possible, and we took flotation samples from each level, and it resulted in a fairly high resolution data set that captured a broad range of materials. We had about 22,000 artifacts from our work. So I'll turn to a discussion of some of the materials that I think that we found that I think provide interesting lines of evidence. Um, in support of the argument that I'm making about workforce diversity and resulting intercultural encounters led to the production of novel labor communities. So with my first example, I'd like to look at edge-modified glass remains, which were recovered in significant quantities from across the site. Um, while often recovered at contact period sites and used as evidence for the persistence of indigenous lithic technologies into the colonial period, their presence at late 19th century industrial sites is much less common. We recovered 541 edge-used or lightly retouched glass plates from across the site, in addition to 823 production plates, or debitage, indicating that glass snapping activities did in fact take place at the site when these objects were coming in already formed. Overall, these glass plates are generally asymmetric, inconsistent in size and shape, and generally crudely formed, suggesting they were created and used as expedient tools to address likely daily and routine cutting, scraping, and shaving needs. The question that arises, however, is why, at a mid to late 19th century industrial site with no known Native American presence, and where metal tools would have been presumably commonplace, is there significant evidence for the creation of these glass cutting implements? Well, I think what's going on here is that glass modification was one response by workers to issues of access in the industrial town. While we recovered a fairly substantial amount of these modified glass artifacts, we recovered a conspicuously small amount of metal knives or other form of metal cutting tools like razors, which often show up on industrial sites. The reason for this possibly is that in the broader environment of increased labor tension, company managers may have controlled or limited access to materials that could have been used as potential weapons in the of violent labor resistance. Or, more simply perhaps, metal cutting and shaving tools were simply cost prohibitive or otherwise inaccessible for these industrial wage workers, and they were simply not a part of their material consumption and use patterns. The modified glass remains, therefore, could be evidence of resourcefulness and thrift on the part of industrial wage workers, them figuring a way to meet their needs despite an economic inability to purchase the formal metal tools or structural limits to their access and use. Whatever the case, this glass handling activity may have been a response, a creative negotiation of various barriers to access that allow workers to meet their cutting needs by fashioning their own implements. Mark Walker, who's a historical archaeologist who works here in California, in his discussion of the material culture and traces of transient working class labor in the 19th century, identifies a preference for portable and expedient material culture. 
He focused primarily on modified metal cans as a creative response to the realities of transient life. But I think the same logic could be extended to modified bottle glass. Rather than investing in expensive and heavy, heavy metal cutting tools, the practices of glass mapping may have emerged as a shared skill amongst transient wage laborers in the American West. Edge modified glass artifacts were found across the site, but they were found in the highest quantities, that part from over there, at the company mess hall, again, the communal gathering and social center um, for the workers in the area of most direct social interaction and negotiation. It's easy to imagine, I think, sitting, uh, imagine the workers sitting at the mess hall benches, casually mapping glass, sharing those techniques, the materials, and the finished edges, as they also share a drink or a smoke and stories from the day, and use those glass flakes to touch up the wooden handles on their tools or something like that. The recovery of these artifacts across multiple spaces, and again in the highest quantities in the shared communal space, suggests they were not confined to one ethnic group or one labor occupation. It appears to have been an emergent practice, a unique but collective response to the particular areas of life in these lime kilns. And that, in its shared enactment, worked to connect the diverse population of lime workers. <clears throat> The materiality of line making is also good, I think, for thinking about how, in a new materialist way, the boundaries of material bodies are blurred, emergent and transformative in interaction. Quicklime began as limestone, or calcium carbonate. Through firing in a kiln, calcium dioxide is expelled, creating quicklime, or calcium oxide, a lighter and more malleable powdered material conducive to trade and transportation. By adding water or slaking, the quicklime, one creates lime putty, calcium hydroxide, a material that can be manipulated into any number of shapes and forms and used for a wide range of purposes, mostly in construction. When left to cure, that lime putty absorbs carbon dioxide, transforming chemically back into limestone. So in this way, through various social material entanglements and eventual reconfigurations, the matter of lime comes to matter in new ways. And these entanglements are not just about humans acting on lime, the line acted agentively on the laborers as well. It was an interaction, a co-constitution of material bodies. Workers' bodies, seemingly diverse in ethnicity, class, and occupation, would have been reshaped in a community of labor factors through shared bodily interactions with line and quick line. Not only would the workers' hands become calloused in muscle and muscles toned through the hard work of manual labor, um, the bodily markers of the working class, but line workers would have shared particular bodily materialities. Their skin covered in a layer of white powder, hair matted with sweat and dust, lungs burning from the noxious air, skin and eyes tingling with a caustic burn. As workers shared workspaces, residences and, residences and meals, they would have also shared coughs, burns, aches, and illnesses like pneumoconiosis, an occupational respiratory disease which is produced by inhaling dust. The laborers' bodies were transformed through the line work, emerging through repeated interactions with mineral bodies in variously shifting forms, producing bodily materialities in ways that were shared across occupational, ethnic, and class lines. These shared bodily experiences and the materializations would have worked to create a community of line workers in physical bodies, conditions, and experiences. And it's not that these masked other aspects of differentiation, but they would have become entangled in the complex formation of community building within this pluralistic industrial site. Embodied labor practices also extend beyond the corporea. In 19th century industrial sites, tools, clothing, personal items, and objects of adornment would have worked with, beyond, or against the body in complex ways to create the very categories that they indexed, continuously creating meaning through their active embodiment. Clothing items recovered show a high degree of similarity across manual labor spaces, with the assemblage being dominated, not that surprisingly, by workwear elements. We recovered numerous Levi Strauss buttons and rivets, many of them still having denim attached, which is kind of cool. We found buttons from other common worker companies like Boss of the Road and Camp Boston. Um, we also found sturdy leather work boots, a pair over there, um, and crosser buttons from work shirts, gator buttons, and workwear jacket buttons. The similarity in material culture is likely a product of function as the nature of line work necessitated sturdy and protective clothing. But that's kind of the point. In labor, in the formation of a particular community of practice, the workers, regardless of ethnicity or language or specific occupation, took on similar material trappings of bodily adornment. New materialist orientations necessitate you think about these materials not as passive markers, but also as active in their own right. 
and these buttons, clothes, and other highly visible features circulate as, as components of bodily assemblages, and they would become entangled in the negotiation of boundary making and community making. In their similarity, I think, they would work to build connections and relations across the traditional boundaries of difference. Um, yeah, reconfiguring differences that matter and working to build the community of blind laborers. Things get a little different when we look at the material covered from the work in domestic spaces associated with the foreman operation, or with the foreman at the operation. Uh, which again, after 1865 to 1909, the manual laborer, although it changed over the years, was always an Irish immigrant who had previously been employed as a manual laborer in the industry and had worked his way up to the position of foreman. So materials we recovered reflect this kind of middle end position, this liminal occupation. We recovered many materials that were similar to those associated with manual labor. We found gene rates and work shirt buttons, as well as alcohol bottles and tobacco pipes. But there were also interesting material examples that differed from their material worker assemblage in small but important ways. From the foreman's office, we recovered things like bone collar studs, which would have taken the place of fixed crosser buttons on the work shirts and cut shell, bone, and even gold-plated jacket buttons, which would have stood out in comparison to the typical cast iron workwear, but workwear jacket button. These objects, I think, were strategically ambiguous. They would have been both familiar and different when viewed by the manual workers in daily encounters with the foreman. <clears throat> uh, these bodily materials, I think, are evidence of strategic practices of boundary making that purposefully created ambiguities that allowed the foreman situational flexibility. Being able to pass as both one of the guys, one of the workers, but then also as the boss who was in charge. Depending on the particularity of the social situation, the same materials could work to both could work to build both cohesion and connection to the workers in their similarities. And in other situations, they could embody the foreman's authority, power, and status in their distinctions. In this way, the materials provide the capacity to slip into various communities or subject positions when it would have been most advantageous highlighting the fluid, emergent, and situational nature of the community at pluralistic sites. So, similarity in material culture was not limited to the clothing materials. The majority of ceramics that we recovered were almost all durable and relatively affordable plain whiteware and ironstone vessels. And they would have been provided by the company for use by the workers at the community at the communal company mess hall. So the plain, sturdy, mismatched ceramics provided by the company may have meant to strip the workers of any potential unifying aesthetic, a Spartan vessel for an austere industrial existence, perhaps. But out of this seemingly undifferentiated collection, the plainness itself may have come at, become an important identifying feature. This is an idea put forward by Margaret Wood, who makes this argument in contrast to the highly decorated tea wares used in socially competitive contexts of the tea rituals that were popular amongst genteel middle and upper class Victorians, where ornate ceramic forms and decorations were actively used to manipulate one's distinction and social differentiation. In contrast, Wood argues that the plainness of the ceramics found in working class contexts, quote, do not represent difference in competition, rather they represent similarity and commonality. And in essence, Wood, or in essence, Wood is arguing that the materiality of undecoratedness afforded a sense of cohesion among workers and undifferentiatedness, if you will, that work to reinforce and actively create connections and com commonalities within a diverse workforce. And while the forms and lack of decorative patterns is pretty common for ceramics from industrial sites, um, the origin of these vessels was a little bit surprising. Interestingly, all of the recovered marks that we, that we found in our excavations were all from British ceramic companies. Out of the 61 fragments with marks, not a single one was from an American potter. Um, a small amount of hotel wares were recovered, and that was a common American-produced ceramic. So those might be American-made, but they, they only represent 2.5% 2, 2 of the total ceramic assemblage. So the pattern's a little bit puzzling, because during the latter part of the 19th century, at the same time that the, ceramic, that the American ceramic industry was growing, and tariffs were making British ceramics more expensive and relatively less accessible, we see that the Samuel Adams owners continue to purchase almost only British-made stuff and specifically Staffordshire produced um, vessels. So this pattern, I think, might be explained by the broader context of global labor relations. Essentially, in the mid-19th century, British manufacturers, especially those that centered in Staffordshire County, were able to gain a foothold in the growing post-bellum American pottery market by, embr by embracing industrial manufacturing practices and anti-union activities that allowed them to keep costs low through increased eco economies of scale. <coughs> 
The low cost ceramics provided by Staffordshire companies, again, afforded partly through these anti labor practices, created challenges for American ceramic producers. North American potters were forced to drop their prices and reduce laborers' wages to remain profitable. Labor in the American pottery industry responded with greater union activity and active resistance to a much greater degree than that seen in England. So while it's possible that the Samuel Adams Company chose to purchase only British ceramics as a purely practical or economic decision, the wider labor context suggests this consumer choice may have also been purposeful and strategic. The pur purchase of only British made ceramics and the avoidance of American made ceramics which were, again, comparably priced and equally, if not more, available, but were embroiled in these more visible labor disputes and unrest, may have been one way in which the line company's anti-labor positions were made manifest. A material, a material discursive, discursive declaration of allegiance with capitalist owners over laborers. Likewise, the small number of mismatched hotel wares that we did recover may be evidence of strategic supplementation by the line workers. An agentive practice employed by the line laborers to subtly align themselves with and support wider working, wider working class labor organization in collective action. Using a personally acquired American made ceramic in the context of ubiquitous British made company supplied vessels in a communal space like the mess hall may have been, in, been yet another form of practical politics. A socially weighted activity that can be seen, interpreted, and understood by other manual laborers. And in its shared enactment, this practice could have built, served to build connections, entanglements, and community amongst the workers in subtle ways that were less visible to company owners than overt resistance. <clears throat> so for my last material example I want to discuss, I want to look at what I, what I personally find is the most interesting and evocative material example of emergent practices at the Samuel Adams Kilns. The artifacts in question are a small assemblage of peckmarked ceramic vessels recovered from the cookhouse and mess hall. The practice of peck marking vessels is a Chinese tradition that continues to today. And remember that the, uh, from at least 1870 until its closure in 1909, there was always one Chinese immigrant um, employed as the cook at the site. And we re re recovered a substantial amount of Chinese-made and traditionally Chinese-associated materials from across the site in multiple spaces beyond just the cookhouse. Some of those things were liquor bottles, uh, glazed stoneware liquor bottles, fragments of pickle and soy sauce jars, opium pipes, uh, rice bowls, and medicine bottles. The practice of peck marking, um, excuse me, the practice of peck marking involves using a sharp implement to remove small dots of glaze in a patterned way to create a symbol or design. Peck mark vessels have long been recognized as a fairly common feature of archaeological sites in California with a Chinese diaspora presence but they are rarely investigated beyond description and translation. In all cases in which peckmark vessels have been recovered, archaeologically, at least in the ones I've been able to, to find in the literature, peckmarks are used to construct Chinese characters, in every case. The purpose of these marks is debated, and it's likely that they meant and did different things in different contexts. <clears throat> While traditionally used as a way to foster good luck and health, in the crowded boarding houses and boat camps of the American West, they may have also served as marks of ownership and identification. Interestingly, the marks we found at the Samuel Adams site are not Chinese characters at all. They are words written in Latin script, or Latin letters. And the word, the pet word in at least two cases is the word chow, C-H-O-W. Oh, that works. While chow could be a name, nothing close to that turns up in census documents or other historic records. Chow, however, was also a common slang word for mixed food in the mid to late 19th century, a slang word that came about directly through Chinese and European encounters in 19th century railroad and industrial work camps of the American West. The slang word chow is derived from chow chop suey, a uniquely Chinese-American class of stir-fried dishes. In the late 19th century, stir-frying was a foreign cooking technique for most Euro-Americans, and it defied translation as English words did not yet exist to describe the, the, the stir-frying method, and as a, as a result, the word chow emerged as the Chinese pinyin word for stir-fried food. The entangled nature of these assemblage objects becomes apparent in attempts to describe them. In these objects, we have a pinyin word, chow, written in Latin, Latin letters, in cursive script, using a traditional Chinese ceramic peck, peck marking practice on British-made ceramics found at an American work camp. Uh, 
at least one of the British ceramics was part of the producer's line of Chinese shape ceramics, designed intentionally to index Chinese export porcelains, themselves linked to global networks of trading, taste, aesthetics, and status. These artifacts are difficult to classify as they defy essentialization. It becomes impossible to identify what parts are Chinese, what parts are European, even who is doing the inscribing and who is doing the viewing. This unclassifiable nature, this ambiguity, this deterritorializing quality is the important feature, however. These artifacts are neither Chinese nor European, nor simply a combination of both. There is something entirely new, an ambiguous material reconfiguration emerging from sustained social entanglements in the California industrial far west. We do need to also think about these entanglements beyond the boundaries of this archaeological site. Both the Chinese folk and the European immigrant laborers were operating within an already existing history of cultural interaction. They did not come together at the same Latin site as fixed or pure entities of Chineseness or Portugueseness. Archaeological examinations of Chinese immigrants often begin with their landing in the United States, forgetting that the Guangzhou region of China, where most of the immigrants were coming from, had had contact with European traders as early as the 1500s. The establishment of European trading ports in Macau and, How in Macau and Hong Kong led to a long history of interactions and mutual influences in the area. To use Anna Singh's words again, the Chinese, Portuguese, and others immigrating to California in the 19th century were already contaminated by a history of diversity and growing global interaction. So when at the Samuel Adams site in the 1880s or so, a Chinese cook is preparing a Euro-American meal for a Portuguese laborer, that encounter, though it may have been novel for those individuals, would have been entangled in long genealogies or cartographies of social material interaction. These interactions of the land kill men are a continued and imminent unfolding materialities of an emerging global industrial world in the 19th century. <clears throat> Critically, these examples show that the blending and blurring practices are not restricted to the realm of language. The peck marks are not just words, they're not only symbols, they're not simply representations. The act of assembling these objects, the inscribing of the word into matter, their circulation and use works to link meaning, practice, and material in new and creative ways that go beyond language and words. With the act of pecking, the word becomes inseparable from the material object. Um, in its materialization, uh, it is in its materialization that the word chow matters and attains a capacity to act, to affect the social world in which it's a part, and to facilitate the emergence and new meanings and work to redraw boundaries. The peck mark assemblage is not limited, however, to those chow marks. There is another artifact, an, in, uh, an ironstone mug from the cookhouse, that exhibits evidence of uh, more crude or non patterned pecking. Here we have what appears to be an attempt to peck mark a vessel. But as Gina Michaels notes, she's one of the few people that's actually looked at peck marks, she says, the creation of a peck mark on a porcelain bowl or plate is not a quick and easy task. We only have needed to apply a hard object with enough force to chip away at its surface, but not so much as to crack the whole vessel. There seems to be something of an art to create clean, legible characters. So what I think this crude pecking may be reflecting is the learning process, whereby someone was developing, practicing, or playing with these pet marking skills. So perhaps a rare example of encounter and experimentation. And many archaeologists have explored the ways in which situated learning and the sharing of practices through doing are inherently social activities that frame understandings of individual and group identity and fitment affiliation, i.e. they frame community boundaries. The evidence for the sharing of this traditional Chinese practice, the experimentation and the learning, the creation of hybrid phenomena, all of these serve, I think, as evidence for material discursive interaction in the making of communities of practice amidst diversity. All of this is not to say that life in pluralistic industrial town sites would have always been convivial. We know that there was conflicts, fights, tensions, and struggles amongst the workers, often along ethnic and class lines. And it would be naive to assume negotiations of difference were always peaceful or productive. But collaboration and community making need not be harmonious. In fact, the contention here is that it's the very no negotiation of alterity in conflict, the shared struggle of working through differences that serve to connect people together as a community of industrial laborers in interesting and important ways.
So, in summary, I've attempted to show that the particular areas of life at the Samuel Adams Lime Kilns afforded novel encounters, the reconfiguration of boundaries of difference, and the emergence of novel communities of practice. Industrial sites, therefore, were places of creativity, connection, and community making as much as they were control, uh, landscapes of control and exploitation. It's not simply that a shared class experience united ethnically diverse workers. A bounded and fixed understanding of class did not simply overcome a bounded and fixed understanding of ethnicity in the creation of organized labor. Nor am I arguing that the ethnically diverse workers created a new, homogeneous, and harmonious culture. This is not a call to return to a melting pot model of change. It's not about assimilation or the wholehearted abandonment of heritage and traditions. It's about ongoing development and change. It's about the ways in which the emergent co-creation of material practices also works to co-create communities. So the title of my talk is a play on uh, the title of a text by Sarah Cowie, in which she eloquently outlines the plurality of power at work at 19th century industrial operations. And in that, she highlights the different ways in which power was made manifest by workers and owners in various forms of material culture and built environment. But I think the materials that we've recovered at the St. Adams site highlight the power of plurality. Early industrial sites were places of struggle and conflict, and as such, they were places of encounter, ambiguity, negotiation, and change. Experiencing, actively, experiencing and actively par participating in these negotiations of difference, I argue, would have worked towards the communal co-creation of new ways of doing and being. And in doing so, boundaries of differentiation would have been reconfigured, reimagined, and remade. And novel communities of practice would have emerged. Communities that afforded later union formation and the possibilities that a diverse workforce could unite in organized resistance to exploitive company policies. So I think that's where I'll wrap things up. Thank you all for your time. Answering the questions at all, I definitely want to say thanks again to everyone involved with the project. Thanks especially to my community, Lori Wookie, who's not here because she's off getting an award in New York. Yeah. Uh, also to Ken Lightfoot and David Engine from the History Department. Um, thanks to State Parks for allowing us to do this work. They really were helpful in facilitating all of this happening. And then especially to some of the funding sources, the Stalin Lori Olson, um, and then also the Jack Kinney Graduate Fellowship in Labor, Culture, and History. So, I'm happy to answer any questions, but thank you. Yeah. How did the laundry product want to get from manufacturing area to company? Yeah, intermediary. Good question. Actually, um, from very early on, there was a large degree of what's called vertical integration within the line industry. So, most of these operations, the companies that own these various operations, also employed their own team scripts, so they use oxen lines, or if they were at the Samuel Adams site, is on a pretty established um, creek, now called Wilder, Wilder Creek. Um, so they would float the process line down the creek, or they would haul them out on the oxen train. And they, if the companies owned their own schooners, the schooners would take that, the barrels of the line to the closest port, San Francisco, up here in Northern California, um, and they were traded out of San Francisco. Sold out. And, and I could relate to that, isn't it? I'm, I'm assuming that the Staffordshire pottery is arriving via Macau or Hong Kong. I wasn't assuming that. Um, it's possible, but it probably would have come through its own sort of exchange networks that imported from the East Coast and brought to the West Coast. Uh, most of the European goods came that way, and went all the way around the shipping vessels. Um, although I'm sure there is the possibility that some trip will be specific trade networks as well. Thank you, that was really cool and uh, for obvious reasons I really enjoyed seeing the Peck Park vessels mm -hmm. and uh, people we've been hearing me talk about that too. <laughs> Um, I'm curious about the photographs that you showed of yeah. the workers themselves. In the Chinese railroad context, there have been some studies of the way that railroad workers appear or don't appear in photographs depending on whether they are Chinese or not. Yeah. And I was curious if you've been able to identify uh, any individuals by name in the photos and if there are any patterns to when or why the photos are taken. 
Um, I don't know if there are patterns as to when and why. Um, I have been able to not identify individuals. I don't know which ones are which, um, as is the case with many immigrant workers who bounced around a lot. They're hard to track down. Um, also, especially with the Portuguese, a lot of them have the same name, <laughs> which makes tracking them through the historical records kind of challenging. Um, so the, some of the photos I know were likely, well I don't know, I think they were part of um, efforts by newspapers on sort of exposés on the local wine industry. So they're some of the really good descriptions of what we get, or some of the best descriptions of what these sites were like historically, how they changed over time, are from these kind of like articles where a reporter goes to the line, comes to sites, and kind of describes what they see. So I have a feeling some of these photos are associated with that, although there aren't photos in those newspaper articles that I was found, or that I found. Um, most of those photos come from the, the Santa Cruz uh, Natural History Museum. Uh, and local history museum and the libraries there have a nice historical department as well as UC Santa Cruz as a whole archive on Cal specifically. So I was able to get some interesting maps and company documents um, that I go into in greater detail in the presentation. Regarding the Chinese laborers not being them, they don't show up in any of the photos and and beyond the San Lado site, I haven't found photos of them in the land film at all. I haven't yet to see a, a display in a photograph. We know that they're there from, again, sort of references in, in historic documents and then in like seven census documents and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, so I find that interesting in that mm -hmm. we don't know who's taking the photograph, or why it's being taken, and why that might have led to the exclusion of Chinese laborers. But from a material culture standpoint, we, I, I think there are evidence of sort of collaborations and inter-ethnic relations and things like that. Mm -hmm. For purposes of time, I didn't go into detail, but we find these Chinese-made stuff all over the site. So um, we're pretty sure that the Chinese cook lived um, in sort of a room attached to the cookhouse, but we find soy sauce bottles and pickle jars, um, Chinese brown stone brown glazed stoneware vessels in the workers' house, even in the foreman's uh, private residences and things like that, which would suggest there's some sort of sharing of, of materials and tastes and all sorts of things. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, man. Uh, I've got two questions. One's really focused on what's kind of broader. The first one is, tell me about the bonds. Second one. <laughs> Second one is, so, you know, like, Andy's been working there for a long time, right? Even I have You know, like, I mean, and then how does what you're learning about the Hill works at Wilder relate to the kinds of stories that Andy's been spinning about these places and the, the stories that we have about Santa Cruz's, you know, Cal, Lyme, you know, I, I think it'd be in different directions, but I'd like to hear from you how you see the narrative changing about these places. Um, yeah, well, do you want to start with the bones? Or yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the, the final assemblage, which I really didn't get into too much detail, I mean, even in the dissertation, it didn't end up being the focus, the main focus data set that we explored things in. But we found, not surprisingly, um, again, sort of this process of vertical integration. Cattle also own huge, head, uh, huge herds of cattle. Um, uh, he lived not far from this operation, less than two miles away um, on Cow Ranch, which was a full company town of its own. And his son was actually the one that was really into agricultural and and uh, cattle raising and things like that. Um, so not surprisingly, we, we see most of the food coming out are domesticates. Um, interestingly, it's a lot of the same elements suggesting, I think they're probably butchering them at Cal Ranch and then bringing um, components to Samuel Adams, again, only a couple miles away. We found, found some interesting historical discussions where they basically say, you know, we would have like big, Big parts of the animal, or in some cases, whole cows or whole animals, and the Chinese cook, they were talking about at the cow site, so it might have been a little bit different than Sandy Mountain, but the Chinese cook would just kind of go in and cut off what he needed every day and cook that up. Um, and so we see interesting in the butcher patterns, we see interesting mixes of hand sawed, kind of Euro American approaches to butchery, but then also cleaver marks and things like that on the same elements, so we can kind of see the ways in which maybe they would be broken down by 
a Euro-American laborer at Cowles Ranch, brought out to the Samuel Adams, and then further broken down by the Chinese code. So there is some cool stuff like that happening. Yeah, and we see interesting examples of supplementation. So there's a lot of like wild rabbit and birds and some fish and mussels. So all things that can kind of be trapped while you're tending to the kilns or like easily acquired at the coast, which is only about a mile and a half away. Um, and so yeah, there's some interesting. There's other conversation we had about supplementation as a way of, if not active resistance, the way in which it's entangled in these community making practices. Yeah. Uh, and then your other question. Which um, is kind of, you know, I think it kind of different stories to what mm -hmm. Andy or what yeah. Sarah said at the town, right? So, yeah, so uh, I don't know if it's very good to, but Cal is kind of revered in Santa Cruz in a lot of ways. Like, there's parks and streets named after them, and a lot of the things you read in the literature that's written in like the 20s and 30s and 40s is like, Cal was not like these other industrialists. Like, he moved his workers and he paid them well, and like, the line workers were paid a living wage, they weren't paid extremely well. Many of the striking, much of the strikes were about increases in wages and things like that. And what we found archaeologically suggests that there was very little investment in worker well-being. Um, the, most of the construction activities date to the early 1850s and then early 1870s, so like right after Cal took ownership. And then we see almost no evidence of like upkeep, collaboration, <laughs> anything like that. Even the ceramic assemblage. This was an operation from 1909. Most of our ceramics date, the oldest they are is 1890, all right? So like these guys are eating up old stuff. It was probably chipped and worn down. Um, and a lot of that I think led to some of the, uh, a lot of that I think people were the labor unrest and these community entanglements that led to uh, formal unification and union activity and things like that. So yeah, I am kind of alone in being critical of Cal, <laughs> but I have no problem. So, so David, <coughs> great talk, great dissertation. So I was always wondering, because I visited out there, were all the workers living up there, all these single men, or did they? Because one of the things I always wondered about, are they, are they part of larger households, or are they in a dormitory? Yeah. How, how is that configured? Because I think that has a lot to do with interaction. That's a really good question, <laughs> and um, it's been really hard to kind of tease that out. Uh, the, the workers' cabins were burned down in the, I think, the 50s or 60s as part of management activities before state parks owned it. Uh, they wouldn't have done that. But, um, so it's hard to really get a feel for how big the workers' cabins were. Um, my reading on it, based on what we could identify in that and what we excavated, was it wouldn't have been, the two workers' cabins would, would not have been big enough to house. Um, even the 30 person workforce, which was what it was in the, when it was just two pots, mm -hmm. um, let alone when it was probably 50 or 60 later in the years. Um, and we are fairly close, I can bring up that other map, uh, to Santa Cruz itself. Yeah. Um, so I think it was very likely that workers came out for like mm -hmm. shifts or okay. cycles or possibly even daily. Um, I was able to track the foreman from about eight, from like the late 1880s. Mm -hmm. and the 90s, um, he was he actually lived on Cowell Ranch and would come out. Well, in the census documents, he was the living on Cowell Ranch, so it's unclear whether his family lived there and he lived at the line or if he went back and forth or something like that. So, what I think actually is the case is that these uh, shared cabins were actually, I actually think they were kind of like flop houses, like. Because it was 24 hour work. Mm -hmm. These kilns burned 24 hours a day, and they had to be tended to 24 hours a day. And the guys worked 11 hour shifts. And so I think it was basically, you know, you had these beds, yeah. pretty, like, pretty limited embellishments in the cabin. So yeah. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, sure. and, you know, like Paul Groth has written about this in sort of like uh, the Tenderloin of San Francisco and things like that. How, yeah. how you could literally just rent a bed. And it was always warm because yeah. you came in as the next guy was leaving, and I think that's kind of what was going on here. Um, and that's why I, I, that's why the and we see evidence of this kind of like mixing and mingling out of cabins, but a lot of the social activity and a lot of interesting stuff is coming from the mess hall, which is where 
think the guys are pretty much just sleeping at the cabinets, but all the interesting interactions, the sharing, the, the stuff is going on at the mess hall, which would have been like, you know, like the, it would have functioned as the, the neighborhood salon yeah. or the parlor at yeah. the social gathering. Yeah. 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 Two different um, amendments, if you will, or about to the theoretical of the materials. And one is to go back to something that was written a number of years ago for Ned and Rick Wilk. Um, he had a whole theory about the structure of common difference. Oh. And I can give you, he published one version of it in the um, Journal of Social Archaeology early on. Uh, yeah. Right, early on. And then probably you know about Jane Bennett. Yeah. 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 Okay. Because so I think what she does is takes in her book Vibrant Manor really takes some of these material things and pushes them much more politically. And I think yes. you don't have as much, at least in what you told us today, as much of uh, the political ramification I, that you could you could push. Right? Yeah. Well, I I am familiar with Jane Bennett's work, and I do discuss her her takes in the actual dissertation. Um, I'm not as overtly political, or maybe. Um, yeah, not as overtly political, yeah. but I hope what comes out of this uh, resonates in especially contemporary conversations where these divisions between us and them are being manipulated and being reinforced and these ideas of who is part of the community and not are highly relevant. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I hope that the conversations are political, just in, the, um, in, in having them. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't lay out some of the overt political